Ladies and gentlemen, fellow scholars, uh, first of all, thank you for taking some time out of your Wednesday afternoon to attend this event. It's the first academic one that the EB Society has held this year. And we can only really gauge how successful our events are going to be by your attendance at these sort of things, so thanks again for coming down. I won't take up too much of your time with this short introduction other than to introduce our speaker for today. Uh, students taking the PPE degree will know Dr. Andrew Baker as their course convener, their PPE SAR. He is the <laughs> troubleshooter. <laughs> he is the honorary fellow of the Sheffield Political Economy Research Institute. He was the visiting professor of the Copenhagen Business School. He's on the advisory boards of the Centre for Progressive Economic Economics. Professor Economics. <laughs> <laughs> And he is the advisor to the Islamic Development Bank and the IMF. His talk today, as he describes it, is a personal reflection and interpretation of the economic problems which were brought to the fore by the financial crisis of 2008. Dr. Baker will outline four underlying problems of Anglo liberal capitalism and their implications for Northern Ireland. There will be a short QA afterwards, so if you have any questions, please do jot them down and we will get to them at the end. <coughs> Um, thank you, enjoy. Uh, first of all, thanks to Connor for organising this and, and giving me this opportunity. And thank you for all of you for coming along. Um, I spent this morning in a, in a meeting with a colleague of mine, John Barry, uh, actually talking about regulatory changes to Five year options on PPE, and as John will testify, I was getting a bit testy and irritable with the, with the remarks of some of my colleagues. So, this is a welcome relief for me to actually come to this and see all these nice, friendly, smiling faces. Um, when Connor asked me to do this uh, and said, Would I do it? I thought that the only time you really get to hear me speak is when I'm introducing you to the thoughts of another academic or introducing you to some debates in the literature. And you never really get to hear what I really think and, and my personal views. Uh, I try to exercise a degree of prudence and restraint. Sometimes they slip out a little bit in the tutorials, but generally I try to keep them under wraps because you know, I try to present the ideas of others to you and get you to think critically about them. So I thought today I would, I would tell you what I really think. But rather than presenting you with a kind of research paper, <coughs> Um, and academic research papers have to do certain things, they have to talk to the academic literature and couch it in terms of certain debates, it can get very narrow and technical. And I don't want to do that, I want to do something more general that speaks to uh, something that should be of interest to all of us, uh, the situation currently confronting us. Uh, and to have that informed by my research and my thoughts, um, but not led by it. So today what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the, my diagnosis, the economic problems that have wrapped our society for the last four years. And we know that in the August of 2008, many large banks' balance sheets were so imperiled that some went bust, others were bailed out, and most availed of government liquidity. And the consequence was that credit to consumers and businesses shrunk, house prices fell, demand collapsed, some businesses ceased trading, Economies went into recession, government debt and deficits ballooned, tax revenues collapsed and social security payments increased. The economy then briefly recovered, then stagnated and now we've entered a second double dip recession. So the question I'm going to address is what kind of crisis are we experiencing and living through? Now crisis is originally a medical term. It refers to the critical point in a medical condition where the patient either recovers or wins and dies. The other principal meaning of the term crisis is a, as a literary or theoretical or theatrical concept. It refers to the key moment of suspense in a plot line where a plot moves in a particular direction. So what you can gather from this is crises are basically pivotal moments of change. So one of the arguments that's circulating at the moment in the world of academia is that this isn't a crisis at all because not much has changed. Uh, and what we're seeing is a case of pathology without crisis. And I don't buy that argument, because if we look at previous episodes of capitalist crisis, and a definitive one is the Wall Street crash, followed by the Great Depression, which led to the construction of the Keynesian welfare state, and a turn away from the laissez-faire economic ideology of the 19th century. 
Is that an approach sometimes referred to as embedded liberalism? The legislation and inter international agreements which enabled that mixed economy system to be built came with key legislation in the US, key legislation in the United Kingdom in 1945, and the Bretton Woods Agreement in 1944. So that's 15 years after the initial point of financial distress, the Wall Street crash in 1929. So history tells us those great transformations referred to by Karl Polanyi and Mark Blyden and others usually take 15 years or more to work through. So it's too early to determine the historical significance of recent events. We'll have to come back here in 2020 and, and, and talk about it then. And by then you'll be far too busy uh, doing other things to bother listening to me. Um, what we can say is that for a crisis to be two crises, they have to be perceived and constructed as such. Crises are always political moments, precisely because they're determined by politics and the interpretation of crisis that becomes dominant. And that depends on which version of events elites can sell to mass publics. And that's the kind of politics we're currently living through. Interpretation and counter-interpretation of recent events. And the, op the efforts to sell and pitch those to us as consumers, citizens, taxpayers. And because of that, so that's why Niccolo Machiavelli advised aspiring statesmen to never waste the opportunity afforded by a good crisis, because crises represent the opportunity to affect political change. And the problem with all these definitions of crisis as critical turning points is they're only partial. They tell us about the effects or outcome of crisis, but they don't tell us about causes. And there's another element to the meaning of crisis, which is the disease itself and its causes. Some deep underlying systemic or structural problems that mean the system, usually a complex systems organisation, isn't functioning in the way it's supposed to. And what we have is the symptoms of dysfunctionality manifesting themselves in various and increasingly dramatic ways. But because these problems are structural and systemic, relating to how the various component parts of the system interact and interrelate, the problems don't go away in their entirety. They move about and they represent themselves in different form and display different sets of symptoms. Which means, until the structural or systemic nature of the problems are actually diagnosed, the symptoms will keep appearing and reappearing. So essentially, I view the crisis as a wider, as a crisis, sorry, of a wider economic system of organisation or growth model that's been characteristic of the Anglo sphere, the Anglo liberal growth model that is characteristic of the United Kingdom, the United States, Ireland. Now, there's, there was a there was, there was a piece published in the journal I'm an editor of by Colin Crouch, which refers to this growth model as privatised Keynesianism. Now, this is a bad term because Keynes was all about counter-cyclicality, and, and this system, I think, is inherently pro-cyclical. More on that later. And it's also dependent upon a gigantic system of rentier finance, both supersized and on steroids. And Keynes would almost certainly disapprove of that. So it's a bad descriptive term from Crouch, but... When you read the article, it's a very accurate account of the growth model. It's one that depends on the provision of plentiful private credit, facilitating home ownership, and private credit acts as the basis for consumer demand. So plentiful credit, cr credit provision, including to low-income groups, and this depends on financial innovation and engineering, investment banking activities that have enabled more credit to be made available to the vast majority of the population and on a greater scale than ever before. The thing about growth models is they're not just academic, abstract economic systems or a naturally occurring economic circuit diagram in accordance with some sort of scientific principles. Growth models are political constructs and they rest on and create a series of political social bargains between different constituencies and different groups of political and corporate elites and mass publics. The product of political choices, but if that's the case, they're also contingent and it means they can be refashioned and remodeled. Okay. <coughs> Four problems that I'm going to point to then. The first one is that this is a crisis of private debt. Now that might seem like a statement of the glaringly obvious, but to listen to much current political discourse, the message is being lost. Throughout Europe, the crisis is rather cleverly and skillfully, it must be said, be being repackaged as a crisis of public debt, not private debt, caused by profligate governments spending beyond their means. It's a crisis of an oversized government, and this necessitates fiscal retrenchment and austerity and the need to shrink the state. We can all see that playing out. 
The point I want to make is the problem, the problem is private debt rather than public debt, and this is particularly the case in the UK. Well, we can see here, uh, UK private debt's over 400% of GDP. Uh, public debt, of course, we know, is around about 70% of GDP. So I think that kind of illustrates the point. Um, so we know, everyone knows that households took on bigger mortgages and spent more money on their credit cards, and that's the narrative or story of the boom period. Uh, and Cam David Cameron likes to tell us we're all in this together, and he likes to urge people to pay back credit card bills and emphasize individual responsibility. A stunning figure is about 85% of people who default on mortgage repayments in the United States blame themselves rather than the system. So we can see that this discourse of personal responsibility is having some resonance. Uh, so the everyday debt we know all about, um, but it's the tip of the iceberg. It's, it's, it's the tip of the iceberg, actually. If we look at household debt here, you can see that it's around in the UK, it's around 90% of GDP. But then private sector debt is well over 400% of GDP totally. So when we look at financial sector debt, <coughs> I've, gone to, I, I've gone to trouble just preparing lots of graphs for you for this talk. I don't normally have graphs. This is the most exciting PowerPoint I've ever done. <laughs> and I'm rubbish at PowerPoint. Um, so when, we look, when you look at uh, financial sector debt, what you can see is that it's over 200% uh, of GDP, and that's really a conservative figure. I want to show you something else now. You can see also here that financial sector debt is uh, in the UK is actually bigger than uh, all these other leading developed industrialized countries. Declared UK bank liabilities. Um, the size of the UK economy is $2.4 trillion in GDP. Declared bank liabilities here uh, from 2008 uh, are, are over £8 trillion pounds or $12 trillion. So that's six times the total size of the UK economy, and much of this remains undeclared. The other key statistic here is that the aggregate balance sheets of the UK's largest banks the largest four banks, are four times total UK GDP. Um, so you get a sense here that we have an oversized and bloated financial sector. And indeed what this graph vividly illustrates here is a kind of path of a giant financial <coughs> bubble inflating up to 2008. Okay, the private debt problem. The key to this matter of private debt is a practice of something called leverage borrowing, to, which is basically borrowing to invest. So in, two, in the 2000s, what, what banks did is they borrowed in wholesale credit markets that they had access to, and borrowing for them was very cheap. So what they did is they borrowed cheap, and they take, took that capital, and they set up off-balance sheet <coughs> devices, conduits, called structured investment vehicles that were subject to all kinds of tax exemptions, and by engaging in leverage, they further reduced their tax bill. Uh, and then they invested the money they borrowed in very high-yield instruments called mortgage-backed securities, credit default swaps, and collateralized debt obligations. So let me explain a little bit about what's a mortgage-backed security. Is this process, I don't know how much you know about it, it's a process of securitization. And what it involves is you take, you take tranches of mortgage repayments and you slice and dice them and then you put them together in different synthetic packages and create a new financial instrument and get it off your books by selling it to someone else who bears the risk of that but also gets a return as the mortgage repayments come in. Um, so you create a new product, new synthetic financial product, a mortgage <coughs> security and that was supposed to spread and diffuse risk. On top of that there was another tier called um, credit default swaps and that was a tier of insurance against defaults on mortgage-backed securities and the repayment schedules associated with that. So what the financial system came to resemble was this kind of multi-tranche, multi-tiered system of debt repayment schedules. From, and if you held bits of this, you got a return on your, on your initial investment. 
So leverage, what banks were doing, was the strategy of borrowing cheap and then investing in high return instruments. And what they're really doing though is playing a game called interest rate arbitrage. You borrow cheap and then you can go up and invest it in these kind of high risk or higher risk instruments and you get a higher return on your money. And that way your balance sheet expands hugely. And you draw down huge profits. Now, of course, this this was supposed to ensure against by all this slicing and dicing going on, it was supposed to make the system more robust. But actually, this complex repackaging of debt meant that the system became more fragile. Um, let me give you a little example here. The average credit derivatives contract, this is incredible, is accompanied by 150 pages of small print. Okay? Um, I would suggest this is overly complex. And what that means is that relatively small changes in market conditions trigger all kinds of complex interactions and that in turn leads to severe financial contagion. Um, now what these practices did do is they increased profitability for the financial sector and they made credit more readily available to ordinary people but there was a flip side to this and the relationship <coughs> also flowed the other way and it meant that when defaults in a small corner of the US mortgage market, what you know as the subprime mortgage market, kicked in this in turn triggered problems in these assets, mortgage-backed securities, collateralized debt obligations, and credit default swip, swaps, and it created a ripple effect. Asset values dropped, over leveraged banks were then left holding worthless pieces of paper. What, what, if you can imagine the market psychology here, what's happening is from being the assets that everyone wants to hold, and there was examples of continental European land bank in Germany turning up on Wall Street and basically saying to Wall Street traders and dealers, We'd like to hold some mortgage-backed securities and some collateralized debt obligations, please. And broker, brokers I spoke to said, well, we tried to warn them these were risky instruments. And the Lander Bank, in turn, turned to us and said, well, everybody's buying them. Just buy as many as you can for us. And they, you know, dealers told me that this was a commonplace, um, commonplace conversation. So, so the market psychology is here is, is that these are the assets that, that everybody wants to, wants to hold. Um, but then you go to a situation where everybody's cashing out at the same time. And depending on how you calculate it, the 2008 crash, crash and I believe that losses are still emerging due to all kinds of complex and arcane accounting practices, blew be somewhere, somewhere between a $2 trillion and a $10 trillion hole in the global financial system. Of course, that left banks balance sheets in tatters. Um, and it also triggered all kinds of rumours about how who had exposure to what in terms of these toxic, toxic assets, which were these worthless bits of paper. And then banks stopped lending to one another in wholesale markets, credit froze. But of course, banks still had all the liabilities from all the borrowing, the leverage they'd undertaken on their books, and they had to meet their repayment obligations, even if many of the assets they bought, bought with all the leverage had been moved off balance sheet and were now worth very little. And of course what we also know is that big profits for banks resulted in plenty of credit for property purchases and that resulted in rising property prices. If on, a, on an everyday level individuals were encouraged to cash in the equity on their houses, freeing up cash for consumer spending, but that in turn resulted in bigger mortgages. And property was the underlying asset for many of these security contracts that went bad and became toxic assets. The other side to this is that, of course, what was happening on the everyday level for, for individual households was that they, they struggled to make repayments on some of their mortgages and repossessions increased. And as that happened, property prices began to fall, which meant the underlying assets for this multi-tiered system of financial innovation were also falling. And all of this, of course, coincided with interest rate rises by central banks around the mid-2000s. And the reason why that happened was because all of a sudden in Western economies you had all these inflationary pressures coming to the fore. And that was the consequence of rising oil prices. I'm sure John will tell you a lot about, about peak oil and its, its, its exhaustion. But the reason why oil prices in the mid-2000s were really for rose because, because the Chinese were going around and hoovering up world oil supplies because their manufacturing was booming to re re meet the rising demand in the Anglo economies, which was fueled by credit. 
So the short version of this was that banks were responsible for creating mountains of debt, believing they had repackaged it in such an innovative and sophisticated way that they'd reduced in risk in the system to negligible levels, and this in turn turned out to be not the case. Um, so then, after that, what we've seen is quantitative easing 1 and quantitative easing 2, or QE2 as it gets called, which are basically central banks pumping money into the system. And commercial banks and investment banks then use that to repair their balance sheets, but the reality is that, by and large, this hasn't found its way into the real economy. So the other thing we're hearing about today is the sovereign debt crisis. But as I've explained, UK public debt is about 70% of GDP, private debt is over 400% of GDP, and so the problem is private and in particular bank debt. Um, and the same is true in the Eurozone. Um, but I, I think we'll, uh, I think I'll, I'll skirt over that because I, I, I don't want to uh, get too much into the Eurozone situation today. Okay. So you look at the figures in 2008, Deutsche Bank had an, an assets to equity ratio of 52 times. So that's, that's uh, capital they held in reserve and then all the assets that invested in. So that's, that's 52 times. Barclays, it was 37.8 times, and BNP Paribus uh, was 28.5 times. Um, so the problem is bank debt over leveraged banks, and, it, and it's not just in the Eurozone periphery here, but as you can see from this, this is also the case in the core countries, France and Germany. Lehman's there. <coughs> um, in its last financial statements, Lehman showed leverage 30.7 times, which is... $691 billion in assets under management in relation to $22 billion in shareholder equity. <coughs> but estimates indicate that they also had $738 billion in off-balance sheet derivatives contracts, structured investment vehicles, and that's the conservative side of things, which for layman's takes leverage up to 60 to 1, which is pretty much ridiculous. But that gives you that gives you an indication of the kind of wild west financial world that was, that, that, that was, that was evident. So the question, the question I'll, I'd like to throw out, I guess, private debt and its management has become the principal fuel of economic growth over the last 20 years, and that went into overdrive in the last decade. But it raises this question of how did we become so dependent on private debt as a fuel for growth? Um, now, most estimates show real wages have fallen by 1.5% since 2008 in the UK. Since 1979, for the bottom half of the population, real wages have been more or less stagnant, and when we go up to 80% of the income strata, it shows a less than 1% increase. And all of this has coincided with the deregulation of labour markets as a response to the economic problems of the 1970s. And we all know the solution to that, put the blame on organised labour, and the answer to those problems became about disciplining labour through wage freezes, tougher working conditions. But then the question is, if you do that, how do you sustain the demand that enables the economy to grow? And obviously the solution that was found to this over the past three decades has been the expansion of private credit, which has been made possible by the financial innovation that I've just described, which is basically Colin Crouch's point about how this growth model functions. The problem is, I put to you, is that entire system is inherently unstable and prone to generating large financial explosions because the amount of private debt it's generated is excessive. Sorry, I forgot to press a button. Okay, stagnant wait. So that's my, that's my explanation for that. So, let's come on to problem two. Problem two is a misallocation of capital. I'd say there's plenty of surplus capital sloshing around the global financial system. Uh, quantitative easing has been used to repair bank balance sheets to a degree, but it hasn't filled, filtered into the real economy or generated credit for business, jobs, economic growth, or particularly increased demand. In the UK and Ireland, we've been good at generating credit. We've had lots of credit made available to us. But it seems to, have got, seems to me, at least, to have gone to the wrong places. Too much of it's gone into property, or fueled individual consumption. And the main consequence is this, is that it generated a property boom, which for many first-time buyers and for many ordinary families, property became too expensive. 
And crucially, property itself became a source of speculation as property development and buy to let became the fashionable professions with big rewards. The problem with our credit system, I would say, is also that it's pro-cyclical. It interacts with the wider economy like petrol does with a bonfire, or water does in downtimes. So it either makes the fire too big, or puts it out altogether. Um, the basic point here is that credit is most available when it's least needed, and least available when it is most needed. And that, I would call, is the pro-cyclical paradox of credit. Um, not enough credit has been used to sustain uh, businesses and sustainable jobs. Um, if it generates high property prices and high levels of personal debt, then there's an argument for saying it's actually socially useless. So the challenge in the UK, I would say, is to redesign the credit system so that it acts as a utility for generating <coughs> sustainable enterprise and jobs and fund socially useful projects, community projects. Um, but that's only the everyday of credit, and there is another world that we know as, is known as shadow banking. Um, another world of credit and capital allocation, shadow banking. Now, the former CEO of Citibank is a fellow called Chuck Prince, and he's got this, he's got, got this really famous saying, he said, when the music's playing, you've got to get up and dance. Um, and what he meant by that is when a, a certain asset class is rising, as the CEO of a bank, he says, you've got to move into the market and get a piece of the action. Otherwise, your shareholders are going to be unhappy with you because your profits relative to comparable banks aren't going to be good enough. The point is that this kind of activity pushes asset values to extremes. And when the market turns, everyone rushes for the exit door at the same time, pro-cyclicality. And that means that many of these asset values are prone to volatility. So, this is... The this is, my, this is the best joke I've managed to come up with. This is my line. So I'm gonna, I need a build-up. <laughs> in other words, Chuck Prince's disco inferno causes murder on the dance floor. <laughs> 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 okay. um, so when asset values uh, collapse, it affects credit conditions in the real economy and ordinary people get hurt. Uh, shadow banking is that infrastructure investment opportunities for banks to take on leverage, set up these off-sheet balance uh, investment vehicles to try and maximize uh, yield. Worldwide, the size of the shadow banking industry is estimated by the Financial Stability Board to be $60 trillion. Right? Does anybody know what the size of the uh, world economy is? What, what total world GDP is, as estimated by the World Bank? Your PPE students. You should know this. If it comes up in a pub quiz tonight as a PPE student, you don't know the answer to this. 30 trillion? Imagine the shame. Sorry? 30 trillion? No. It's tiny, but it really sounds like 2 trillion. No, no, no. It's actually 63 trillion dollars. Uh, so, shadow banking is this off balance sheet activity that is the size of the world economy all over again. Okay? Um, the size of the US economy is 14 trillion, so shadow banking is over four times the size of the world's biggest economy. And so much of it's virtual and doesn't show up in any official figures, and it operates through virtual hubs like the City of London <coughs> now. The Financial Stability Board is, is a new institution that's set up, it's trying to monitor and map shadow banking activities, but of course it's kind of running to, to catch up all the time. Um, Why? The global derivatives industry, right? This is global derivatives contracts, outstanding, nominal, right? Anybody, any idea how big that is? This is, this is a phenomenal figure. Uh, of course, derivatives contracts are all kind of a series of bets on what ha might happen at some point in the future, right? So it's not really. So it has the capacity to expand even further. Um, so derivatives contracts outstanding nominal are believed to be at worth around $600 trillion. So that's 10 times global GDP. And what this means is that half percent error in collective risk management could lead to losses of $300 billion. So they're mind-boggling sums. Does anybody know how big a trillion is? Or, like if, if you went home tonight and somebody said to you, can you describe to me how big a trillion is? Could anybody, could anybody stitch together a description? Fourteen zeros, isn't it? I mean, one, I mean, it's more than ten zeros. 
But that, that's a bit abstract. I've got a really good question. I watched a video uh, on YouTube. It's supposed to be like crates of $100 bills uh, stacked on top of each other uh, like several times per width and breadth of the football pitch. That's, that's one script, and I think, I think yeah. it takes about 32 football pitches. Or something 32 like pictures. <laughs> um, right, I've got, I've got, I think, which is, I think is, is, is the best description I've read of this so far, right? I've got it for you here. Um, if I put you in a, in a huge bank vault somewhere around the vast US prairies that just went on forever and ever and ever, and it's just this huge big bank vault, right? And uh, said, you can keep every dollar bill that you can initial, right? And somehow you were able to work 24 hours a day, seven days a, w seven days a week, working every second without stopping, initialing dollar bills. After 12 days, you'd be a millionaire, right? After 31.7 years, you'd be a billionaire. But only after 31,708 years would you have a trillion. And that number is only one six hundred of the size of the global utilities <laughs> market. Um, I think you're getting, you're getting the picture here. Um, the, the problem, sorry, the problem with shadow banking is largely dead money. It depends on market movements and interest payments and profit tends to get invested in further instruments. And for the real economy, what seems to have happened is it's generated unsustainable credit booms. So the question for me and the one that keeps me awake at night is, is this the best usage for the world's resources? Um, it's certainly done a lot to make small numbers of people very rich, but has it done much for the vast majority of the world's population, apart from giving Western consumers access to unsustainable levels of credit? Uh, those of you who are doing my level two module will discover on tomorrow that John Maynard Keynes referred to all this kind of activity as rentierism. This is the practice of high net wealth individuals not investing their money in socially useful, productive investments, um, but earning interest or hoarding. And Keynes called for the euthanasia of the rentier. What he meant by that is not to line them up against the wall and shoot them, um, although some people obviously want to do that at the moment. Um, but by denying them investment opportunities and limiting interest payments on accumulated capital. Um, so I would say that shadow banking and its infrastructure essentially mean we've lived through an era of rentierism supersized and on steroids. Uh, it's a kind of Frankenstein monster. And I firmly believe we've got to do something about shadow banking and something quite radical, in fact, is just as cut, cut, closing large down, areas of down altogether and uh, certain aspects of the global derivatives industry. Um, I think it's also worth saying that on capital misallocation, current figures suggest, in fact, I believe now it's gone up to 900 billion. I, I, I was looking at this about a month or two ago. It was said that UK corporations have sat on 750 billion of retained earnings. That's a third of UK GDP. So how do you get that money into play so that it actually generates jobs in society as a whole? And that's one of the big challenges. Okay, my third problem, the external deficit and a crisis of external indebtedness Basically, what I would say is that market or neoliberal ideology is that successive UA, UK governments have viewed their role as getting out of the way, right? This is how UK uh, governments help the economy. They get out of the way and let innovative uh, private forms of investment run their course. Um, but the consequence of that is that we've tended to consume far more than we've produced. We have a financial service industry that's good at attracting surplus capital from around the world and processing it and recycling it. But our external debtedness is shown in this graph here, and as you can see, it's touching 400% of UK GDP. Um, and given those kinds of figures, I would suggest that uh, looking at total public debt, sorry, I can flip that back if you want, if anybody wants to have a see it again. There you go. 400% of GDP. Um, focusing on the, on, on the government debt of 70% of GDP might, might, be, might be focusing on the wrong debt and the wrong deficit. Uh, of course, in the case of, of, of the government debt, most of that's owned by British citizens, which is actually different from Irish public debt, which is owned by all kinds of international investors, particularly French and German banks. Um, get a chance to talk about Liverpool now. My great passion. So even if you look at manufacturing success stories such as Jaguar Range Rover and Hailwood in Liverpool, 
and they went into round the clock production in August, what you find is they're owned by Indian investors. One of the reasons for that in the UK is we've got this competitive and aggressive market for corporate control. And while other countries have protected some of their own strategically important companies, our investors tend to gravitate towards shadow banking, derivatives trading, and short-term gain. The, the average share of a British company is held for no more than seven months. You know, there's a serious shortage of long-term investors out there. Patience does not go with modern contemporary finance. So, okay, it will, my, <coughs> my basic point here, it would probably be true to try and make more things and export more and to actually own more productive activities rather than simply holding financial assets. Okay. There's a paper by a guy at the Bank of England called Andrew Haldane. It's called The Long, sorry, The Short Long, which explains how long-term horizons have been progressively shortening in human life generally. And it's due to the, this is happening because of the neurological reaction in our brain as a consequence of technology. You know? We just press buttons and things happen instantly. Um, and this is particularly the case in financial services, so that even supposing long-term investment can now be mathematically shown to be increasingly have a short-term horizon. And Haldane's conclusion is that what suffers most is long-term infrastructure projects that actually do the most to generate sustainable growth and improvements in the performance of the real economy and in most ordinary people's lives. <coughs> they get start with investment because investors think short-term and lack patience. Uh, that argument, if you take it to its logical conclusion, it has two implications. If you want a private sector solution to that problem, you have to look to reduce short-term investment opportunities. You've got to downsize rentierism on steroids. Or you look for a public sector solution through various state-led investment projects or state-guaranteed investment projects to fund investment infrastructure projects which the private sector don't have the patience for and are unwilling to take all of the risk on board on their own backs without some sort of public guarantee. So that indicates, for thinking outside of the box in terms of developing an industrial policy, I'll come on to say a bit more about this later, um, but basically the point here is the UK needs to think about how to reduce its external trade deficit and its current account deficit, because as it stands it's very vulnerable due to the size of that external indebtedness. Now we're getting on to the real business and the real meat here, which I, which I really want to emphasize. Okay, this, this rise in private debt and the rise in shadow banking, based on this trend of financialization that I've described to you all, and it's based on the doctrine of shareholder value. One, two, three are connected to this fourth phenomenon, which is a rise in inequality. And what we're talking about here is Wage stagnation at the bottom end of the income spectrum, and it's been accompanied by this turn to private credit. Now, there's a brilliant book that really gives a devastatingly penetrating account of this. It's by Stuart Lansley. It's called The Cost of Inequality Three Decades of Super Rich and the Economy. And so, if my talk convinces you to read one book, it's not an academic book, it's something you can pick up and read. Make it that one Stuart Lansley, The Cost of Inequality. And Lansley points out that during the past 30 years, a growing share of global economic pie has been taken up by the world's wealthiest people. In the UK and the US, the share of national income going to the top 1% has doubled. So today, you've got the world's 1,200 billionaires hold economic firepower that is equivalent to a third of the size of the American economy. This is unprecedented wealth concentration. Okay, so Lansley's argument is, is this concentration of income <coughs> at levels not seen since the 1920s, incidentally, and we know what happened then, um, that is the real cause of the present crisis. So he points out, um, <coughs> in the US, a typical worker would be more than £3,000 better, better off if the distribution of output between wages and profits had been held at the 1979 level. In the UK, they'd be £2,000 better off. Um, and the result of this failure, he argues, is that consumer demand suffers. 
So what, when we look back through history, what we see is a link between inequality and economic instability. The Great Depression of the 1930s and the financial crash of 2008 both had something in common. They were both preceded by vast increases in inequality. Uh, wages lagged behind productivity growth in the 1920s and from the 1980s onwards. And Lansley argues that this growing gap upsets the natural mechanism to achieve economic balance as ordinary people's purchasing power shrinks and to fill the gap we have private debt. So the turn to delay, delay is a recession, but it doesn't prevent it. Um, the other side to this is that the concentration of wealth in the hands of small groups of corporate elites not only stifles demand, it fuels asset bubbles. In the 1920s, in the US, enrichment at the top end of the income strata fueled property and stock market speculation. In the 2000s, we saw a tsunami of hot money being invested, um, creating bubbles in, in property securities and commodities markets. And all the time, the share going to manufacturing and other activities shrunk. Um, so the evidence suggests there's a widening gap, income gap, and a more productive economy don't necessarily go hand in hand. Um, an economic model that allows the richest to consume an ever-increasing share of the cake will eventually self-destruct, is a proposition that I want to put to you. So a more sustainable economy, and a more efficient one, crucially, also has to be a less unequal one, is an argument that Lansley develops. Lansley, Lansley makes four points, really. It's worth bringing them out here. Once inequality goes above a certain level, economies develop a tendency to deflate. And we see that in falling demand, falling income levels, rising unemployment, and falling living standards. The basic point here is those at the top can only consume so much. And what they do is they accumulate surpluses, and then they have to hoard and invest it and recycle it in rentier activities. The concentration of wealth in the hands of a small percentage also produces bubble economies because those surpluses have to find a home and they get invested in various asset markets. Um, bank assets ballooned four times faster than economic growth from the 1980s onwards in the UK. And of course, the biggest re re returns in the shortest time span can be earned in unproductive activities such as shadow banking. Productive activities get starved investment, got all these takeovers, private equity and financial engineering proliferate, real economy stagnates, we've got fewer jobs paying, decent incomes are being generated. And what we end up with is concentrations of wealth, which also produces concentrations of power, and we get finance and city, city lobbyists getting what they want, which is basically what the story of the 2000s were, and regulators and policymakers appear to have been captured, resulting in those kind of light-touch regulation policies, which is basically a tick-box approach that placed too much faith in bank and investment funds' own internal risk management models, uh, mainly because it was believed that financial markets were efficient and that prices would be uh, tend towards a natural equilibrium, and so we end up with something resembling regulatory capture. Um, for those of you level two, I, I, this will be the subject of one of my lectures, actually, the subject of regulatory capture. Um, okay, one, fi one fi real final point on this, I guess, is that one of the things that fuels this spiraling of the inequality. Actually, I want to. I'm going to skip over. The, 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 there was a section here on. Um, I've got five minutes left. Ten minutes left. Um, you could take another fifteen if you wanted. Can I? Well. That would be. That would be <laughs> I was going to talk to you a little bit about about the global tax avoidance industry, which basically um, um, you've got two professions: accountancy and estate and trust planning, and they they base an increasing share of their activities around devising tax avoidance schemes to minimise the tax payments of high net wealth individuals and corporations, and they lobby heavily in favour of such policies. Um, and I'd suggest that it's, that it's not a surprise, of course, that on a, on a local scale, we see accountants amongst the biggest advocates of low corporation tax here in, in, in Northern Ireland.
Um, so there's stuff here. Oh, no, okay then. Um, <coughs> I think all of this is part of a wider problem that Anglo, Anglo liberal societies have with tax. Um, I think it's kind of socially and culturally constructed as something that doesn't legitimately belong to governments. It's taxpayers' money rather than government's money. It's somehow taken away from taxpayers. Uh, and this cultural attitude spills over into a tolerance for tax avoidance activity and a kind of general disdain for having to pay tax, as well as the virtues of low tax regimes, corporation tax. Um, and if you have low taxes, business will prosper and, mag and growth will magically materialise if governments get out of the way and leave businesses to it. Um, the problem is that three decades of these attitudes and policies have produced more unequal and less stable societies. Well, my conclusions. Um, to, on the subject of, of, of inequality, if you divide the United States into five buckets, 20% each, right? Okay. Um, how much do you think the bottom 40% own in terms of total US wealth. The bottom 40%, that's a big, big chunk of the US population. It's 0.3% of total US wealth. That's almost nothing. Okay. Um, if you go up to 80%, the bottom 80%, how much of total US wealth do you think they hold then? People are really startled when you tell them these figures. 16%. So you've got the top 20% in the United States owning 84% of total US wealth. Now there were two US professors, uh, Dan Arley at Duke and Mike Norton at Harvard, and they did a little survey and they applied Rawls Veil of Ignorance, which I know some of the PPE students love. Uh, and they said to them, look, if you didn't know, end up, know where you'd end up in society, you had random entry into society, you could end up anywhere. Mm -hmm. What kind of income distribution would you like? And they showed them an income distribution that is the United States, the one I've just described to, them, to you. And then they showed them one that's more equal than Sweden. And 92% picked the enhanced Swedish model. And here's the really, the really interesting thing. 93% of them were Democrats, but 90.5% of them were Republicans. <laughs> um, so the point here was that you, if you pose the question, people seem to want a more equal society, but obviously that's not the prevailing political ideology. And the point they were making is that people kind of gravitate towards political brands and labels. And once you take them away, you get very different results. Um, I did want to talk a little bit again back to the UK issue and the, and the figures for the UK incidentally are not as severe as the United States um, the top 10% in the UK own 53% of total UK wealth the five, top 5% 40% um, in the UK the bottom 50% own 7% of total UK wealth so it's a, be it's a better distribution than we see in the United States but let's be clear here it's heading one way and it's in the direction of the United States, and that's something, I think, to be aware of. So, two weeks ago, the Resolution Foundation carried out a report for the Institute of Fiscal Studies uh, and for, found that living standards are likely to fall for low- and middle-income households, and that's even if there is steady growth up to 2020, which incidentally is highly unlikely to materialise. The typical low income family net income will see a net income fall of 15% in real terms up to 2020. A household close to middle income is it can expect a fall of 3% by 2020. And those findings are based on growth of 1.5% up to 2015 and 2.5% up to 2020. Um, the top 50% can expect to grow by their incomes to grow by 0.2%. And of course, that growth gets much quicker the higher up you go. Um, and the reason they say for this is basic shift in patterns of employment. Um, what we're seeing is a shift towards high paid professional managerial jobs at the same time as a growth in low paid service sector jobs. Right? And so, what's happening here is you're getting the, a disappearing chunk of middle level jobs. Uh, there was more traditional jobs, skilled administrative ro roles, skilled manufacturing positions, 
are drying up. And that's happening partly because of the International Division of Labour. And the basic message here is millions of families are going to struggle, particularly, and there's going to be a bigger gap gap between the top 50% and the bottom 50%. The picture here is social polarisation, and it's growing. Um, the, the argument the report makes is that if wages were to grow at the same rate uh, as following the, the minimum wage uh, was introduced in 1999, you could do something about this. Secondly, you could do something about it if you increase the proportion of women going into work so that you reach somewhere along the lines of, of Scandinavia. And you only do that by expansion of childcare provision. And the third thing you need to do is training, improving intermediate skills through vocational training programs. And if you do those things for middle income families, uh, their income will increase by 8%. This is, this is, this is what the report tells us. Um, um, but this challenge is, the key thing here is that this challenge is kind of one of the key assumptions. If you have growth, because all of this is premised on, all of their report is premised on growth, that it provides opportunities for all. And that the message here is that it's not enough to have growth anymore. Uh, without intervention, growing social divisions are likely to set in. Um, you're going to end up with a fundamentally unequal society with skewed incomes. Uh, and I think really you've got to forget ideological dogma here. Not intervening just isn't an option. Uh, a s relatively modest, pragmatic interventions can deliver some quite handsome re rewards. Um, so let me come on to, to my conclusions. I haven't said anything about, about Northern Ireland. Um, I've made the point that we're too reliant on private debt. And circular capital is plentiful, but it's misallocated, right? Um, these two tie together. If you look at Northern Bank, right? That's a bank that stayed away from securitization, derivative, shadow banking activities. It had losses of 66 million in the first half of the year. Now, Danske Bank, the parent company as a whole, uh, had 550 million euro profit. So, all the banks malfunctioning and underperforming. And of course, the reason for that is, uh, is property debts, both here in the Republic. Uh, we go back to 2005, what you see is Northern Ireland's growing at 3.2%. That's twice as fast as the rest of the UK. And most of that growth was generated by property developments and speculation. Um, you know, crazy, crazy, crazy figures. Northern Ireland, by, two, eight, by 2007, had be, uh, property prices here had become one of the highest in the UK. And they were actually only behind London, the South East and the South West. That's a giant property bubble you're talking about there, given where Northern Ireland started from 10, 15 years earlier. Uh, you know, in my everyday life, I bought a house in 2004. By the end of 2006, I mean, estate agents were asking me if I wanted to sell it because it nearly doubled in value. I just know that something unsustainable is occurring there. Um, but if you have huge property bubbles, what you'll have is huge amounts of bad debts, bad private debts. Um, and so property is inherently cyclical. What, what you've got to do, really, I think, is, is to follow the, the credit cycle. You've got to look at ways of reducing the amount of credit allocated to property when prices go above a certain percentage increase, uh, some sort of counter-cyclical dragging anchor. That's going to be technical, isn't it? Um, so there was a saying, of course, that portfolio diversification in Northern Ireland consists of moving your money from residential into commercial property. Um, Ulster Bank's in a bad way. It's basically a zombie bank. There's just no doubt about that. Uh, as part of the RBS group. Um, local politicians, well, in more ways than one, in fact, Local politicians need to look at ways they can underwrite lending to SMEs, uh, and particularly in innovative areas. Um, guaranteeing part of the value of loans to reduce risk for private sector lenders. I came across a really interesting thing said by a guy called John Cunningham, who's the managing director of Calvertech. That they employ 150 people in Northern Ireland. He says that research and development is our lifeblood but that venture capital and banks won't invest, so we have to do it through retained profits. He uses that as a justification for low corporation tax. But there's the problem for you right there. You've got to get credit to where it's needed. 
rather than inflating property bubbles and come up with a strategy and ideas for doing that. And you're actually not going to do that by the state sitting on its hands and going, let's call it cooperation tax. <laughs> the external deficit, um, the, the, the fourth problem, we've seen this in Northern Ireland. We've seen it recently, the case of F.G. Wilson. This is a profitable local business that was bought by multinational capital, Caterpillar. 760 job losses are going to rise to over 1,000. They're moving production of generators to China to increase shareholder return. Big is beautiful uh, for shareholders. The point here is that what, what we're seeing is companies becoming separated from their communities as they become footloose. Now, the accounts were published for F.G. Wilson last week, incidentally, and it found the total, uh, what, what, the, what the accounts reveal is that total sales increased from 100 million, by 100 million to 770 million. Uh, but profits turned from 7.8 million in 2010 to a 5 million loss. But if you read on in the accounts, the reason for this is a rise in administrative expenses from 23 million to 33 million, which is basically an accounting device that F.G. Wilson have been saddled by as a branch plan by head office. Mm -hmm. And that justifies the change in location. Um, now, there, there's another justification, because you can increase your returns by going to China. Of that, there is no doubt. But you know, this wasn't a crucial situation where they were losing huge amounts of money. Uh, so at, least, at, least, at least there's very little to suggest the Northern Ireland branch actually was, even though the accounts suggest it was because of some chicanery. Um, so there's an ownership crisis, and you've got to address the ownership crisis. And that means one of the things politicians need to do is have a look at company law. How do you share risk? How do you build long-term commitment to companies to create trust relations? Uh, how do you increase worker ownership, and how do you build that in so as to, so as to encourage long-termism? Uh, constructing communities which are embedded in their local communities. And I would suggest this is less of a leap for Northern Ireland than other parts of the UK. I think community, family, education, strong institutions here. I think actually Northern Ireland's the least neoliberal part of the UK. You go to England now, go to any social or public space, and don't forget I am from England. Well, Liverpool. Um, <laughs> every single social and public space is run by large corporations, for large corporations. I don't want to live in a society like that. And I think that the corporation tax debate in Northern Ireland takes us in that direction. Um, I think we've got to grow indigenous cooperatives, mutuals, employee-owned companies, family-owned firms. Um, and th that has to be fostered and encouraged. We've also got to pay, policymakers have to pay closer attention to which foreign companies own stakes and holdings, what they're here for and what their intentions are. One of the big things Northern Ireland should be looking to do is create science innovation parks, building the universities in, getting stakeholders in, uh, having stakeholder governance of these things and getting the banks to the table, getting employees, getting owners, investors, getting, getting the state, the local politicians working together to grow the commercial potential and knowledge base based on the two universities. Enormous potential to expand in renewable technologies and, uh, uh, and green energy <coughs> solutions. And the natural resources, you think about the coastline here, you know, this is where Northern Ireland's potential comparative advantage lies. And all we get is this ridiculous debate on corporation tax. It's ludicrous. There's a fifth problem of the Anglo-Saxon liberal capital model, by the way, which is, of course, all of this is probably ecologically sustainable in the long, unsustainable in the long term. And you know, I've not included that here because it's something that you know, the financial crisis gives you an opportunity to rethink that. But I'm not an expert on it. But John Barry's book, and what you should do is get him to tell you what his book says in a bite-sized kind of hour chunk. Uh, because I think it's one of the best books, social science books, if not the best social science book that's come out at Queen's University in the last 10 or 15 years. And there's absolutely no doubt in, that, in my mind on that. It's on such an important topic by one of the most knowledgeable fellows in the business on this subject. <laughs> um, <coughs> And of course, we've got inequality here. <coughs> you know, if you cut corporation tax, you're also taking well, the current treasury estimates of 700 billion out of the block grant. You know, the cutting corporation tax, given the trends in the labour market I've just outlined, you can't possibly work in Northern Ireland unless you have massive upskilling. And the, the, uh, 
There's, there's an absolutely fanciful Oxford economics report. I think somebody at economics is smoking some serious gear. And stuff. <laughs> they are estimating that this is going to generate 58,000 extra jobs up to 2030. And I don't see where those numbers are coming from. Because when you look at that in its totality, that suggests that over the next 18 years, you're going to generate an extra 115,000 private sector jobs in Northern Ireland just by cutting corporation tax. I mean, this is jacking the beanstalk stuff. It's literally <laughs> believing in magic beans, plant them in the ground, next thing you've got this magic gene. But it's fairy tale. If we just do this, everyone will live happily ever after. That is the tone of that particular report. I just think it's nonsense. Um, the report itself does admit that none of this can work unless you see a 70% increase in STEM professionals. So you're going to you're going to have a 70% <coughs> increase in STEM professionals while basically taking a 10% cut a year out of the block grant. Good luck with that one. <laughs> um, sorry to have gone on. I think I think Northern Ireland basically. My message from all of this is I think Northern Ireland is a crossroads. I think the corporation tax, which is basically the only debate in town, doesn't address any of these four problems. Least of all, this last one of inequality, when you've got a situation where in certain communities in this city, you have 85% of the population leaving school with either no qualifications or less than two GCSEs. Um, at the same time, you have more people here... You have the best A-level results anywhere in the UK. So you've got this social polarisation right in front of you in Northern Ireland. And you're going to have to, you know, if you're going to compete in the one world, you've got to address that, which is why corporation tax is the equivalent of blowing your own feet off. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sorry.